It corresponds to Slavoj Žižek's definition of a quote, finite totality. Every language constitutes a totality, a universe complete and closed in itself. It allows no outside. Everything can be said in it, yet this very totality is simultaneously marked by an irreducible finitude, end of quote. In the case of Calderon, this is made clear by the fact that the point I am trying to make is one where the space it is one of the spaces where traditional philology and new historicist criticism converge. When Balbuena Brione states that, quote, Calderon defiende la tesis providencialista del descubrimiento de América, según la cual los españoles fueron el medio que eligió Dios para la evangelización del nuevo mundo, end of quote, he is in complete agreement with Morenes in the sense that the meaning of the discovery and conquest of America is to be found not in the new world, but in the old. Michael Rowland summarizes both views when he writes, quote, the creative impulse which animates the central action of the drama stems from the belief that the Inca's conversion to Christianity was essentially the reenactment of an established pattern which had been articulated before in a different time and place, end of quote. What I'd like to concentrate on here is the vital importance that both the and and Miskoy give to the role of spectacle in the creation of a monumentalizing icon or in other words, how their enterprises work toward the conversion of the historical encounter into an aesthetic experience, a dialectical process which in and of itself tends towards the subversion of universalizing pretensions of imperial discourse. This dependence on theatricality and performance, like imperial discourse itself, becomes in the words of Yupangi, the Incan protagonist of La Aurora, una escamada culebra, tal vez que todo el conforme enroscadamente cerca hasta morderse la cola dando a su círculo vuelta como que da a entender, a entender cuánto es misteriosa la selva a quien hacen, hacen guarda tales prodigios. And it is here where the evanescent symptom of the constitutive lack at the heart of imperial discourse opens up the possibility for a sideways glance at the other in all its fascinating and terrifying potential but perhaps not where we might think to look for it. The other imperial reason that becomes most visible in the flags of our fathers, for example, is not the Japanese soldier, but rather the internal, uncolonized other who looks behind the spectacle of national triumph in the form of the alienated and disillusioned heroes of Iwo Jima, accidental actors who don the masks of protagonists in a national epic drama. In his book, Transitional, Transnational Cervantes, William Childers reminds us that both the colonization of the New World and the imposition of Catholic Orthodoxy in Spain were parallel processes with a similar underlying structure of power. I use the term internal colonialism to highlight this parallelism and the whole. Indeed, the main structure of ontological difference in Calderon's play, which pits the barbarism and blindness of the idolater against the aesthetic distance and metaphysical self-awareness of his Christian conqueror, is the very same structure used on the peninsula to dialectically oppose the Christian to the Jew, the Christian to the Muslim, or indeed, from a different point of view, the Protestant to the Catholic. That is iconoclasm versus iconophilia. But rather than dwell on whether the Incans are idolaters or whether Catholics are not, a more productive way to approach this structure would be to follow Mitchell's lead and recognize that, quote, the rhetoric of iconoclasm is a rhetoric of exclusion and domination, a caricature of the other as one who is involved in irrational and seen behavior from which we are exempt. In the quote. What Mitchell's Marxist analysis of some of the rituals underlying the study of ideology shows is that the representation of ambivalence about one's, one's encounter with the other is ultimately a type of camera obscura or mirror which reflects in, in a defamiliarized way a culture's ambivalence towards its own ideological antagonisms, or deadlocks, as Zizek calls them. As I hope will become visible in the following discussion, the attempt to define one's heroic role in messianic vision and history against the backdrop of a meticulously constructed other is yet another example of the serpent who ends up chasing its own tail. One of the most curious yet generic aspects of La Aurora is that the climax of the play asks the spectator to participate in an experience of divine presence in which the image of the Virgin becomes momentarily animated, embodying, in effect, the transcendent essence which her image 
is merely supposed to evolve, at least according to the dogmatic aestheticization of religious image, images articulated by the Council of Trent. This structure is deployed throughout Golden Age theater, particularly in sacramental plays, but the way in which it inverts the discourse of iconoclasm is no less striking for its ritual repetition. From the point of view which emerges if one treats the image of the Virgin dialectically, the Christian believer suddenly becomes the spitting image of the idolater he is supposed to replace. In that, the image becomes the thing in itself, an icon, an idol. Of course, this seems to be possible by the theatrical apparatus of Hellenism's disposition, a realization which converts the experience from one of real religious presence into a simulacrum of religious presence made possible both by theatrical sleight of hand and the rhetoric of iconoclasm, which plays one type of blindness off of another. Let's remember that faith is also blind, not just the idolatry. Calderon inserts this aesthetic self-awareness, or distance, into the ritualistic staging by making the figure of idolatry responsible for explaining, in allegorical terms, what is happening, thus providing a theologically correct interpretive frame. As spectators, we are led to witness how each spectator perceives not the moving picture itself, but rather the idea to which the material object refers in his imagination. In the words of Vincent Horton, quote, Suave, irónicamente necesita esa misma facultad del ingenio, o entendimiento humano para percibir y buscar la correspondencia establecida entre los correlatos alegóricos para interpretar personalmente las metáforas y alegorías que representan la universal redención. End of quote. Without this theological frame, however, without, in other words, the aesthetic distance marked off for us by the narrative of idolatry, the actions of iconoclast and iconophile seem uncannily similar. What I'm attempting to do here, of course, is to mark off my own distance from Martin's impeccable theological reading by focusing on how the theatrical frame which makes the representation of the experience of presence possible in the end prevents the closure of the religious allegory ostensibly desired by the religious image. Nevertheless, within the structure of the play, there is little if any room for a divergent interpretation of either the first encounter itself or its meaning and function with respect to the redemptive history of the Inca as there is a constant stream of theological commentary and interpretation issuing from a quasi-transcendental perspective in the play. The only question really is what to do with the source of this commentary. 